So hello and welcome to the first ever episode of Wild Journeys podcast. Uh, I'm joined today by Ragnar Axelsson, uh, one of Europe's most acclaimed photographers and it's an absolute honour to have him as the first guest on the show. Uh, He's been featured in Time magazine, National Geographic, in Life magazine. He's published numerous books on life in the Arctic and it's just great to have him here. How are you Ragnar? Hi, thank you. It's an honour being in the show. Thank you. (laughs) Great to have you. Um, So I'm going to just jump straight into it. What is it, Ragnar, that just makes you get up out of bed every single day and uh, get out there in the cold and keep taking photos after 40 years in the Arctic? (laughs) That's a very good question. Uh, So it has, I think, a very strange answer, you know, because uh, when I I, I first, my interest in, in the Arctic, especially in the cold, the places on Earth is uh, reading books by the, uh, the great explorers, you know, in the old days. Uh, Peter Freuchen is uh, one of great of them, and a great uh, Amundsen and all those guys that when I was reading their story, it, I, it got me interested in, in going there and seeing that photograph. Then I did learn to fly. I was going to be a pilot and um, I flew uh, as a co-pilot when I was collecting hours to, to Greenland in ambulance flights. And I wasn't keen on what I saw. It wasn't very, I was a little bit disappointed, but then I started going and, and real journeys like to Tule and Kanak up north. Uh, yeah. And uh, and those people are really nice and and, and, uh, and it's big heroes to me and what they have gone through throughout the centuries. It's really amazing. And uh, so I started going photographing. This was difficult to go. Everybody, when I go one first time to Africa to photograph, as a lot of photographers were doing, <clears throat> I worked on a newspaper. And uh, and when you came there, everybody was there. It seems like you know, every photographer in the world was in Africa. So I decided to go the other direction where nobody would go. And very few were actually photographing in Greenland, especially up north. And, and, you know, so uh, I got excited by that. But uh, I promised myself never to go back again. They always freezing all the time. But when you got back home, it, it takes a week, then it's like a magnet. It drags you back over and over again. And it's challenging to photograph uh, in, in conditions like that. Very challenging. Yeah, and, uh, I suppose, how, how do you deal with those, <laughs> with those challenges? Obviously, there's, there's extreme cold and there's, there's managing risk and, and certain dangers involved. Um, is, is there a lot of sort of preparation that goes into each trip? Oh yes, there's a lot of things to think about actually. I, I was, uh, all the gear and everything has to be perfect because you're not allowed to make mistakes when you go with the hunters out on the ice on a tox sled. <clears throat> you go for a few weeks and you sleep in tents. So you have to be or, or every thing, every little thing has to be thought of. It's like you're going to the moon. You have to, you know, you have to rely on yourself more or less, or them, or the hunters. That's what I did. <clears throat> and uh, so, yeah, you have to be very well prepared. I was not in the beginning. I, I let him make a lot of mistakes. You know, I think everybody would do that, but uh, but you learn from it. And uh, yeah, and, uh, I still yeah. do make. I mean, I was reading a story not not long before this podcast about you uh, with some uh, hunters, I think, in Greenland. And um, I think you were going after polar bears or they were going after polar bears. And it was a case of just getting almost way too close to be safe to the to the bears to get the photo and, and to sort of have the experience. And I remember thinking that just must be insane to have that feeling of um, almost life or death or in, the, in between life or death. Yeah, but when you're excited about getting a photograph which you've been trying to get for years you know been missing all the time so when the moment comes you just you're gonna get it and the polar bear was running away actually so I was running after it then it turns <laughs> back <laughs> that's very stupid when, when you look them in the eye very close it's uh, it's not wise but uh, it, it's um, I rely on them so I was I was safe and all that but uh, it was it was it was hard for a long time to get the photographs of that I, I wanted to do. But I, I want to photograph the people and the environment, you know, and, and animals. And uh, then you have to get to know them and gain their trust and be with them, come up over and over again. Like one of my friends, he's a polar bear hunter. He's, I, I've been with him for 40 years, something like that. And so he, 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 trusts, he trusts me perfectly so I can photograph him. So when we're traveling, I'm not there. I'm just taking the pictures I want. So that's the thing I really like to 
Yeah, okay. And uh, it, sort, it sort of feels like you spent a lot of time um, living with people that are kind of on the edge of civilization, if you like, um, sort of way out there with, without much contact with the rest of the world um, and dealing with the consequences a lot of the time of the rest of the world with the likes of climate change. Um, what have you seen or what have you experienced up there that um, kind of tells that story or, or doesn't? Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I, in the beginning when I started, but I just wanted to get good photographs. I wasn't thinking about climate change or anything like that. I was freezing most of the time. So, <clears throat> but then I found out later what was happening, and they were telling me things, and they kind of were walking on the pages we were reading about. So they they felt what was happening. The ice was getting thinner. You see a photograph, and you can't see a difference. It's just white wilderness, but the ice is thinning from underneath, from below. So it was more and more unsafe, and the hunters are getting fewer and fewer, and uh, so they have to get a new kind of job or something. So and the young generation doesn't want to be a hunter because it's a tough life. So I, I thought this was kind of this kind of life was fading away, you know, if I say so, or would be a total change in, in the future. So I tried to now photograph every in all eight Arctic countries. I got very interested in the Arctic because it's going to be a very big issue on the planet in the coming years, uh, whether it's because of us or natural causes or whatever people would say, it's happening. So things will change. And I think it's important to document things like that, like on Earth, our planet. and to, Because it's like a little piece of a uh, you know, big, bigger puzzle to what, what, what you do or I do. And it, when it gets into a big picture, then more and more people will see the life up there and um, start maybe thinking about things more. How oh, our life is changing on our planet. It's the refrigerator of Earth. It's it's nothing. It keeps the the, the temperature you know tolerable on, on the planet. So I think it's important to document it and show, it, make books, and that's what I'm doing. I'm going to all all eight Arctic countries, and we're doing a new, new book coming out soon. The Arctic Heroes. It's about the Arctic dog and the hunters and how they. With beautiful stories from the hunters. I write them always down, uh, and it's actually uh, something that few have heard actually. And when everything was over, the dog took you home. So it's beautiful stories. It's a tough life, and actually, it's something that I, I feel like has to be documented. Yeah, it, it seems like a tough life, and it does. It seems to be a fantastic relationship between uh, man and dog out in the Arctic as well. Um, I think yeah. every every country seems to have a, a very tight tight relationship with their dogs, um, and they seem to be vital to life out there. Yeah, it is, but it, it's changing too because they were thirty thousand uh, ten years ago. Now they're about eleven, twelve thousand. So it's they're all declining. And uh, you know. is that is that due to to just less people being out there and and less hunters being af- active? Yeah, it's because of that. The, the hunters are making the number of hunters. Going down and uh, smaller villages are closing down in some areas, like on the east coast of Greenland and uh, Scottish area. There, are, there were three villages. There are only two now. There are only one now. They, they closed the other two. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. And then the fewer hunters. When I came at first, there was dogs in front of every house. Now there are very few dogs. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Where Where is it that you you find yourself going back to the most when you're talking about sort of eight different Arctic countries? <coughs> like to sort of document where is it that sort of draws you the most well so far it's uh, Greenland and Siberia has uh, and Russia has been okay. uh, I, I, Russia is very exciting uh, it's uh, it's so big and he, it's so huge and there's so much to see and uh, I was in Siberia and I really people were very friendly and helpful and so it's been great photographing there I have to go there once or twice maybe three times more and I was supposed to go to uh, Franz Josef Land and to uh, to the uh, to the North Pole this summer, but it, it's 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 not possible because of the virus. So we yes. delayed for a year, and it okay. delayed that book for a year actually. Really, what, seems uh, like the whole the whole world's on hold at the minute. Um, yeah, I did I did actually see you were doing some documentary of uh, coronavirus in Iceland. Yeah, I did. I uh, I drove around the country when. Uh, because it's all part, all the pictures. Iceland is one of the eight Arctic countries, so I, I photographed Iceland, and, and everything was closed down, and nobody was outside. I just went out driving. I didn't. I, I can't stand still or stay inside. Yeah. So I started driving, and I ended up by me driving around the island for three days, two and a half days, and 
I met four cars and I saw two people. <laughs> so there was everybody inside wow. and you never seen that before. You had the yeah. feeling that you were alone on the planet. And was the really country fully closed off to tourists as well? Yeah, everything was closed. And people were supposed to, you know, to, we are free of the virus now because we closed everything down and you, everybody could see where you were on your phone. So it's a, uh, it was a very, I thought took a good stand on it immediately. So uh, we are, we have now, there's virus is gone here and every life is back to normal, but it's closed down. It's opening up in a few days so people can come, but there were no tourists here at all. Yeah. When, you know, nobody was here. Yeah, must have been a fantastic experience to have the whole place to yourself. <laughs> it was good for a photographer. There was nobody in the way, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you could speed like 150 kilometers an hour, and no police or anything. <laughs> 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 it was, it was, did you not? Did you not have any restrictions on on where you could travel or or anything like that? <laughs> no, we. I thought there were going to be restrictions, but it wasn't. I thought they would close the sections, but it wasn't like that. So I could go every where, wherever I wanted to, and that was. Uh, but that was very, you know, strange to do. And then and when I finished that, I, 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 I started photographing the COVID itself, actually. I went inside the hospital to photograph a sick man. And, um, you know, in a, I was in a kind of a spacesuit, you know, photographing. Yeah. And, and photographing, uh, you know, to document things like that, too. Yeah. So I thought and got their stories. It was... It was scary. It was probably the most scary thing I'd done, you know, go inside in a room that, oh, you might get the virus, but yeah, but I didn't get it. So You're well I protected. always think that something happens to me. So it's it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic, and it, it seems like even even when the whole world is locked on, you've still got your your camera in hand, and you're <laughs> you're still on the move constantly, which is fantastic to see. Um, I did hear as well that you've um, sort of founded a, a publishing company um, that's sort of doing some work in the arctic or, or basically set up to, to sort of highlight life in the arctic and what are your what, what are your sort of plans with that uh we we started with three friends who made that company to do books about the arctic because uh, we're all of us are interested in the arctic so we want to do books and show the world you know what what's happening or and um, it's it's i worked on a newspaper so it's fun to I, I, what i like is doing my own programs you know that way. I, it's, I think we all should do that. What, how you feel of your work, do it the way you want to do it. Instead of on a newspaper, you're always taking the safe photograph to please someone quite often. So now I, I got my mind rid of that, just to do my own things. And we, we want to do those books. The book business is a very strange business, uh, but it's fun to make books very good. And, and it has to be. We're going to do exhibitions every time. We did a book last year, the glacier, and uh, did an exhibition. That was a lot of people came to visit. And it's been in Seattle and it's been in Washington, so it's traveling, and it's fun to do it. see your work like that. Yeah, fantastic. And I actually wanted to talk to you about glaciers as well because um, it was an interesting move away from documenting, I guess, mostly people, um, to just doing sort of more abstract pictures of, of, of landscapes from, from the sky a lot of the time. What was, what was the driving force between that, that change? It was kind of relaxing, you know. It was fun. I, I flew in my plane, did it all from the, from the aircraft. I, I, I feel like not, I'm, well, I shouldn't say that or feel that way, but I, I don't use drone. Well, I had the drone. I flew on a tree in five minutes, so I, I take the pictures in my plane. The worst pilots on drones are pilots. So yeah. uh, I flew in my airplane and did all the glacier work in that in the, from air, an airplane. No, the the, uh, the glacier work was fun to do. Actually, it was I liked that abstract work to do, and, and I always tried to see some figures or faces. Have you seen it? Um, I've seen I've seen the pictures from it. I haven't actually got the book, but I've I've seen the majority. Uh, of uh, uh, you send me my, uh, your address. I'll send it to you. So. Oh, thank uh, you. But. Uh, and uh, it was I can try to see some kind of figures and faces in the ice. There's a lot of it, and the, there's a lot of ash on the glacier from the volcano eruptions. Yeah. That's the best place to see it on a to go, and it's all kinds of forms, which I had so much fun to photograph. It was relaxing, but a challenging too. And was it was it you flying the plane and taking the photographs at the at the same time? Sometimes, but usually I have my friends with me, you know, to. Oh, the you know the steering wheel when I'm photographing, so you can concentrate on the picture. It's better. 
But sometimes yeah. there was no one available, then I was alone a few times. Mm, seems tricky. Seems challenging, that's for sure. Um, so obviously you've moved back to, to, to documenting people um, with your next book. Um, what, are the, what are the sort of main lessons that, that you've kind of learned from the people in, in the Arctic? <clears throat> wow, that's a... Um, but I learned for me uh, how those people are very, you know, easily uh, humble, and uh, and they, they, you see them on the street. They they're, not, they're shy, but when you're when they're on the ice, they're like James Bond. You know, it's they're really tough, and uh, I learned from them a lot about nature and how to you know behave there, and uh, and what to be aware of and things like that. And they teach me a lot of things, which is. I, I I do respect them, and uh, I learn a lot, and that's something that follows you in life. You know, think about uh, others and and the planet as a whole in, in a new in a new way, actually, or respect. Yeah, for sure. And and I guess with with the planet, then where have have you seen that that impact is being felt most? <clears throat> um, we seen it here, like the glacier book was like kind of a poem or old to the Icelandic glaciers because I grew up underneath the glaciers, so I've seen the retreat every year, and uh, that you can see easily here how they're they're moving hundred meters a year, you know, back and uh, thinning, and then in Greenland you see it like uh, in Green in Scotland where I've been going back and forth for for years, thirty five four years. And uh, my friend, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's, I asked him this March, so I said, how is life, is it, how is the ice, sea ice? And the answer came was, uh, which I get a lot every year, uh, there's hardly any ice. Nobody can walk on it. We can uh, ride the mountains to the next village. I really do miss the old Greenland. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, you hear it from them, who grew up there, that the hunters and don't know the best that is what is happening. And uh, like the glaciers here in Iceland, they've been smaller and, and they have been bigger. And uh, we're in that phase of going down now in mountain. So that's really, really happening. But it's you can see it uh, in Greenland very, very you know, rapidly. It's how, how, how the climate has been changing. Like the one fjord that I've been 20 years ago photographed, uh, it was. More than 22 years, and it was it was 20 years in between. So it was uh, all frozen. You could walk on the ice, and you could fish through the holes. But now it's you sail on a boat. So it's open water. You know, at the same time of year, you know, in March, 20 years in between, and it was totally different for all this. Yeah. So that what you saw, you see it very dramatically how what well, changes. Yeah, and in, in your opinion, what's what's the solution to that? Maybe that's I'm not sure. Question. I have to leave it to the scientists, you know, to set tell what 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 it is, well, and uh, if there is a solution, is is it? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it's really, I, I I understand young generation to be worried, and I want to, you know, the reason I do also photograph well, the beginning uh, when I was photographing, I wanted to sh make a book and uh, books and show people uh, the life so we have to respect life up in the north and, and the people living there have to have a chance to survive and get a new job or something if their job is fading away like the hunting life so I, I thought you know when you think uh, uh, when this question comes from your grandchildren granddad why didn't you do anything and yeah. that's when I want to say well I tried I, I, I took those pictures to show the world and now it's up to it's there are more photographers doing great work in the Arctic now. But uh, I was used to say to my friends, they're always photographing icebergs floating from left to right, teasing them on that because it's 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 fun. They're great, and but it, they go for two days and then they go back home. I stay for three weeks, you know, to photograph the people, and it was just tea. But it's great what they do. It's it, it's, it's it's part of everything to show is that to show everything you can do to open people's eyes. Yeah, I think I think for me, what what your photography is doing is kind of show the uh, the harsh reality of of life up there, and 
almost capturing the drama um, or capturing the um, those moments where it's sort of in between um, life and death and a hunt, or if it's even just people that are just working hard day to day, um, it kind of sheds a new light on you know the, the variety of life that's up there. You know, I think with, mm. with young people that don't necessarily know what it's like up there, you kind of picture one thing, maybe a, a man and a reindeer, and, and you don't really look at um, the sort of breadth of life that is up there. And um, it's been fantastic for me to see over the last few years things that um, I probably would never have seen if it wasn't for, for your photography. So, yeah, definitely. Oh. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I think you should go and do it. I think you would love it. You know, it's uh, and I, when I was in Siberia, I was in the Nenets, you know, the reindeer herders in, in, in tents. Yeah. Would you? Uh, and I was thinking, uh, how could we really do have it? But would you be living in a tent like that all year round? Around, you know, it's it's a very tough hard life. It's a hard labor, and and uh, the average age is not very high. You know, so it's a tough life. Uh, but it's look great in cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh it's the same with uh, uh in, in greenland and it's really really it's it's fading away and it's in this last moments actually of, of the life that you can photograph uh the inuit hunters uh, the way in a few years you can't photograph them as, as it is today but it will it will be on i mean for Yes, up, up north they're wearing what I like the best is they most is when they're wearing those skin clothes you know? yeah they have the trousers and reindeer yeah that's that's reality now they're wearing more and more you know fancy clothes which is not as warm so on a photograph it's not as nice but uh, well let's I have a photograph as it is but when you when you're with them um, uh, on the ice in wearing those polar outfit clothes. It's like going back 100 years in time. You yeah. Know, it's, so you're yeah. photographing like, yeah, it's like going back in a time machine, photographing life as it used to be. But that's very boring. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I guess that's that's kind of it from me. So uh, thank you very much, Ragnar, for, for joining today. And for anyone that's listening, uh, rags.ie for, for Ragnar's website and at Ragnar Axelsson on Instagram. And um, thanks very much for speaking to me today. It's been an honor. Thank you. It's an honor for me. Thank you very much.